We need to leave. Now. Hey, welcome back, Screen Crush. I'm Ryan Airy, and this is all the Easter eggs, references, and little things you might have missed in The Bad Batch, Season 3, Episodes 6 and 7, Infiltration and Extraction. Now, if you've only seen Episode 6, we are going to talk about that episode first, spoiler-free, and then move on to Episode 7. This episode features so many callbacks to The Clone Wars and early Bad Batch episodes, bringing the series full circle. We're finally starting to see Rex's clone rebellion, and also THE rebellion start to take shape. And I just want to remind you guys that if you do like what we do here at the channel and you like these videos, please support us by shopping at our merch store where we design all the merch ourselves. We have this really cool Hello There, the original trilogy, prequel apologist, Say No to Death Sticks, The Apprentice Lives, and many more. The link is below. Now, the title of this episode is Infiltration, and that has a few different meanings. One, obviously, it is about Clone X infiltrating Rex's clone stronghold, but also the new squad suspects Crosshair of being an infiltrator. And finally, we see this same theme with Senators Chuchi and Sink having the very earliest discussions about forming a rebellion to infiltrate the Empire. But, more on that later. I think it's interesting to see how the Bad Batch is very slowly building on Crosshair's defection from the Empire. The characters have to learn to trust him, one by one. First, it was Omega, then Hunter, and now Hauser and Rex. But with each person, Crosshair is atoning for a different sin he has committed. With Omega, he's atoning for his original sin, joining the Empire, something that Omega could sense he wanted to do all the way back in the first episode. I know what you're going to do, but please don't. Because she is far sensitive. That's right, at least her blood has a high M count, but more on that in just a bit. Next, when Crosshair earned the trust of Hunter, he had to revisit the planet where he fragged Lieutenant Nolan. And finally, in this episode, he has to atone for turning in Hauser and the other rebellious clones on Ryloth. Wait, where was that again? Back in season one, the Bad Batch went to planet Ryloth to assist freedom fighter Cam Syndulla and his family, including Lil Harris Syndulla, leader of the Ghost Squadron in the show Rebels. Hauser and the others refused to turn in Syndulla after they served with him during the Clone Wars. And this was one of many smaller clone rebellions popping up after Order 66. Crosshair arrested Hauser and the other clones, and Hauser still holds a grudge. Most of my squad from Ryloth is dead because of you. So, we begin on the planet Pantora, and there is a lot of Arabesh on this world. A lot of it actually was too blurry for me to read, but here we can see Ando and Raps, so maybe that's a restaurant that sells Lando or Mando Raps. And the Arabesh on this circular sign reads, Almost Seafood. Now, I couldn't make out the exact writing around the circle, but I'm pretty sure it just reads the same thing. And this one on the right reads, Famous Gyros, but it's backwards. Hey, when you make all these videos, do you, like, translate those Star Wars letters just, just from memory? Yeah, man, I read Arabesh. Oh, okay, well, what other Star Wars languages do you speak? Uh, well, no. No one can speak a Star Wars language because they are not real. But if you want to learn an actual language with Babbel, they're the sponsor of this video. Like I know a lot of us are planning our vacations for when the warm weather comes. So while you're booking that dream trip to Europe, go ahead and get started learning a new language with Babbel. That way, when you take your trip, you'll be able to navigate through a foreign country. Oh, does anyone here speak English? Babbel makes learning a new language so easy. Like I took Spanish in high school and I thought learning a new language was just learning vocabulary words. So I struggled. But Babbel teaches you the language slowly from the ground up. The lessons you sit situations and dialogue that you would actually use in the real world. Like one of my favorite activities, leaving a party. Adios, Carlos. Oh. Ya te vas. Now, the lessons are all like that. They're slow and easy to digest. You can do yours for about 10 minutes every morning. Babbel helps you start speaking a new language in just three weeks. You use these short 10-minute lessons that are made by actual language teachers, not some AI or an algorithm. In fact, to get 60% off your subscription to Babbel during their spring sale, click the link below or scan this QR code. And I'm telling you guys, Babbel really works. University studies have shown that 15 hours of Babbel equals a semester of college Spanish, and they offer lessons in 14 different languages. Now, Babbel has a few different different subscriptions to choose from. So if you are interested in learning a new language, this is a great opportunity to try it out. Plus, they have a 20-day money-back guarantee, so you can try it out and see if it's right for you. Check out our link in the description or scan this QR code to get started today to get 60% off your subscription during their spring sale. Now, back to Bad Batch. Now, Pantora is also the home world of Senator Chuchi. You'll remember that Chuchi was the senator who fought for clone rights last season when she lobbied to have a clone rights bill passed. She also uncovered the conspiracy that the Empire destroyed Topoca City on Kamino when she revealed this information to the Senate, Palpatine stepped in and blamed Admiral Rampart for the crime. This unprovoked attack on Kamino was a cowardly act by Admiral Rampart to further his own personal agenda. 
And we have actually seen Senator Chuchi since that episode, after Omega and the others rescued Hauser from the Empire. It's implied that Hauser was being taken to Mount Tantus, where he might have become a brainwashed soldier like Clone X. So, no wonder he resents Crosshair for turning him in. Now, we have seen Pantora before, first appearing in the Clone Wars episode Sphere of Influence. Notice how the architecture is influenced by the ancient cities of the Middle East. There's the dome towers, the golden adornment on the railings, and even the bulbous design of the streetlights. And yes, we also see a cobblestone street with steam rising from below, like something you would see in modern New York City or like 19th century London. But then they've also added in the neon signs to give this a sci-fi Blade Runner feel. Like all the best Star Wars, this planet feels both familiar and new. For a moment, we see the planet through the view of Clone X's sniper scope, which really brought me back to my glory days of Star Wars Battlefront sniping Ewoks. Seeing the environment through the view of technology is also something we've seen a lot in Star Wars. We saw characters do this in A New Hope, Empire Strikes Back, Attack of the Clones, and basically all throughout the Clone Wars. Rex is on an undercover mission escorting Senator Avi Singh to meet with Senator Chuchi. If he's undercover, why is he wearing his clone armor? He sticks out like a bantha on high. Well, because protection, and he is wearing his cloak. Fair enough. Now, Rex, of course, is the captain who led Anakin's division, the 501st, but Senator Singh was one of the leaders of the Separatists. Now, in the movies, we just see the Separatists as these greedy bankers and captains of industry, but in the Clone Wars, we get a much more nuanced story. In the episode Heroes on Both Sides, Padme actually visits the Separatist capital and Avi Singh's homeworld, Raxus. We see that most of the Separatist worlds were just well-meaning governments that grew tired of the Republic's corruption and wanted to start fresh. Now, of course, all of this corruption was engineered by Palpatine, specifically to cause planets to secede so he could start a war and rise to power. This also created deep-seated resentments following the Clone Wars. And you might remember this from Season 1, the Bad Batch actually were sent to rescue Avi Singh on Raxus after he refused to vocally support the Empire. I can no longer condone this unjust occupation. But some members of the group resent being asked to help a Separatist. Help a Separatist? Not gonna happen. This was all about the squad's evolution to realize that the war was over and that they had to evolve to face their own true enemy, the Empire. And this is a cool detail, Senator Singh is dressed like a middle European royal family member from the early 1910s. Specifically, look at the Archduke Franz Ferdinand. Now, the Archduke's assassination was famously the excuse that many great powers used to go to war with each other, when their true goal was actually to seize money and power from the other nations. Now, I've always thought that the Clone Wars were symbolic of World War I, two sides fighting a nebulous conflict, but a lot of the soldiers weren't even sure why they were fighting, and the real reason was just to benefit the powerful elite. So it's appropriate that Singh dresses like the losing royal family of that war. And in another callback to Season 2's episode Clone Conspiracy, we have the return of Clone X. In the Coruscant arc last season, an unnamed, mind-controlled clone assassin was hired to assassinate the Kaminoans to keep the destruction of Topoka City quiet. That clone was commissioned by Admiral Rampart, but now we learn that all of these clones were brainwashed on Mount Tantus. So Singh sits down with Senator Chuchi, and I love this scene because what we're actually seeing here is the very beginning of the rebellion that we saw in the original trilogy. Originally, we saw conversations like this featured in Revenge of the Sith deleted scenes. Do you think he'll dismantle the Senate? Why bother? As a practical matter, the Senate no longer exists. And, you know, fun fact, Genevieve O'Reilly played Mon Mothma in those deleted scenes and then later in Rebels, Andor, Ahsoka, and Rogue One. Now, last season, Chuji had a very similar conversation with Bail Organa. Now, Bail Organa started planning the rebellion against Palpatine, like, right away, when he saved the lives of Obi-Wan and Yoda and agreed to raise Anakin's daughter. We even see him recruiting young Ahsoka Tano as Fulcrum in Tales of the Jedi. So, last season, we saw him start to recruit Senator Chuji. The issue of clone rights is part of a much bigger picture. And in this conversation, Chuchi even echoes his words. And the Emperor is afraid. The Emperor is concerned. It's interesting to hear that they all think the Emperor is afraid, but they have no idea he is a Sith Lord and that he actually kind of feeds off of fear. They're still treating him like a politician and, you know, not like an evil space wizard. In the conversation, we learned that former Separatists were likely some of the earliest members of the Rebellion, but all of these different factions were decentralized and disorganized for more than a decade. Remember, on the show Andor, Saul Gerrera even mentions the Separatists among the different Rebel factions. A Separatist. My pays a Neo Republican. The Gorman Front. Galaxy Petitionist! They're lost! Eventually, the destruction of Alderaan is what causes all these cells and systems to finally gel into a single fighting unit. So, now I want to talk about the clones in this episode. There are a lot of them. Now, Hauser, I've already mentioned, and we're also introduced to Greer, Hilo, and Samson. Fireball is the flamethrowing wielding trooper who we first met in the episode Tipping Point, the one where Omega and the others rescue Hauser. And another member of Rex's team is Wolf, aka the clone who lost an eye to former Dooku apprentice Asajj Ventress at the Battle of Korm. Now, I bring that up because this season is going to see the resurrection of Asajj 
Dodge Ventress after her death in the canon novel Dark Disciple. Great book, by the way. So I'm wondering if we might see Wolf encounter her again and then bring up the whole you took my eye in combat, you dirty sep thing. Funny. Now Rex and Wolf also appeared in the show Star Wars Rebels about 15 years after this point. They were both semi-retired with another clone, Gregor. In season one, the Bad Batch actually rescued Gregor from the Empire on planet Darrow, which is why Rex says this. Where are you based? Coruscant? Daro. because Gregor would have provided them intel about that planet. Gregor is not in this episode, but Wolf mentions his recipe here. Gregor's recipe, with a few of my own spicy modifications. Which is a cool touch, because in the Rebels episode, The Lost Commanders, Gregor has a Wookiee-sized appetite. It's gonna be delicious! <laughs> And the final clone I want to call out here is Scorch. He is a Republic Commando who has been a quiet Bad Batch antagonist from the beginning. Scorch first appeared all the way back in the Clone Wars episode Witches of the Mist when he led Delta Squad to Toydaria. But he's been in several Bad Batch episodes, capturing Omega on Org Mantell, fighting the Zillow Beast, and even hunting Gregor on Daro. When Hauser and Rex take down Clone X, they make sure to use the stun setting on the blaster that we first saw in A New Hope. There's one set for stun. Because, as we saw last season, these Black Ops clones, like Hydra A, agents bite down on a false tooth and commit suicide so they won't be taken alive. Rex knows about this capsule because he saw the clone assassin use it in Clone Conspiracy. I also love the design of their armor and helmets. It's unlike any trooper armor we've seen before. It's menacing, the retractable faceplates make it easy to see the characters wearing it. In fact, they could have learned that trick from the MCU. And notice how the helmet was pressurized, like the helmets worn by Mandalorians and Darth Vader. It's a callback to how, in Ralph McQuarrie's original concept art for Star Wars, stormtroopers and Darth Vader only wore masks so they could could breathe in space. Also, there's a subtle moment here. I got him. The clones use the same comm system sound that we heard here. Showing how, in a lot of ways, all the clones are still haunted by their original sin, turning on the Jedi Order and obeying Order 66. They take a data puck from the assassin with targets encrypted on it. This is similar to the data pucks that we saw in The Mandalorian, which listed different bounties. Let's see the puck. Rex's base camp is an old Bomar monastery. Where it looks like Jabba's palace. Correct. The Bomar monks were a religious order that, to transcend the physical world, had their brains placed into robot spiders, like this one in Return of the Jedi. That is why these little spider things are still walking around the palaces. And this means that they left their palaces empty, so Jabba the Hutt was able to take over their monastery without using any force. And it seems like something similar has happened here. The main entrance hallways are even like the ones we see in Return of the Jedi. The layout of the command center looks very familiar. We have these circuits circular hollow table like we saw in movies like Return of the Jedi, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. And of course, there's also these navigation maps like the ones we saw on the Rebel bases on Yavin 4 and Hoth. And there is an extremely deep cut Easter egg in this episode that was driving me nuts, so I devoted over an hour of my precious life to track it down. You hear this short track? What's your name, Trooper? Composer Kevin Kiner lifted that tiny little musical motif from the opening of Return of the Jedi. What's your name, Trooper? What's your name, Drew? And I know that because it was on the soundtrack for one of my all-time favorite computer games, Star Wars Rebellion. Cheese person, good catch. High five. High five. And I forgot to mention that the droid with Senator Singh and the one with Scorcher are both RA-7 protocol droids. So, after Clone X is captured, we get a hint at the true cost of war, when Hauser wants Rex to torture prisoners. You need to push him harder. Now, it's interesting that Hauser is so distrustful of Crosshair, and Crosshair is like the most ruthless soldier we've seen in this show, like when he didn't hesitate to kill civilians on Onderon. What are you waiting for? Give the order. Now, last week, I asked all of you in the comments for some help in identifying Echo's ship, and you answered. Dambox4500 said, this ship is called the Ramona. The ship was once a mining vessel that had been retrofitted for stealth infiltration. That's the title of the episode. Hey, I have a question. You know, Hunter, is that like a birthmark on his face? No, that is actually a face tattoo, and in this shot, you can see on his upper lip that the tattoo is meant to look like a skull, the symbol of the Bad Batch. I guess the tattoo would also help him to blend into environments. When they arrive at Rex's base, Wrecker says, I don't look happy to see us. Just like old times, huh? <laughs> and we saw this attitude all the way back when the Bad Batch debuted in the Clone Wars. The regs were always distrustful of the Batch because they were regarded as irregular mistakes. Crosshair even references this prejudice subtly later on, after Hauser is suspicious of him. Tried. It didn't work. Being defective is in my nature. He does this in a way to remind his brothers that reg troops have always been distrustful of the Batch. Meanwhile, Echo gives Omega a new toy, I mean a new energy weapon, replacing her bow with a crossbow. It's more suited to her size and also it's like Chewbacca's. Hey, 
Can I try that? Now, Clone X arrives on a stealth ship that has a very Sith-like design. It's modeled like a triangle, like the Sith holocron. This is because, like the Jedi, are always in a circle. They sit in a circle. Everybody's equal. But the Sith are a pyramid because there can only be one master at the top. The rear engines and interior consoles are red as well, and the consoles are even shaped like triangles. Hey! Triangle. So we finally find out Rex's game plan. He's not trying to overthrow the Empire or start a galaxy-wide rebellion. He's looking out for his brothers. Rex wants to liberate the clones of Mount Tantus. The wrinkle is that these clones are individuals and some of them have chosen to stay there. This conflict of personal choice is actually what the Bad Batch is all about. Omega mentions M count. And of course, we all know that M count refers to your midi-chlorian count, like Dr. Pershing references in The Mandalorian. I highly doubt we'll find a donor with a higher M count. Palpatine was collecting Force-sensitive DNA, so he could clone himself a Force-sensitive body. And this is also why we saw him collecting Force-sensitive babies in both the Clone Wars and Rebels. What's midi What's midi-chlorian again? <sighs> microscopic life forms that live in your blood and they're a scientific way to measure force sensitivity. Can we go back to saying them count? Yes, please. As Clone X sabotages the compound, the Arabesh here reads signal loss. And this one reads no signal because he's knocked out their comms. You can even see a communicator dish on the console. Notice that Clone X recognizes Crosshair immediately. That's suspicious. That's weird. Now I'm wondering if there's something that Crosshair is still holding back. He knows about this clone program, and he says they tried to reprogram him, but he was defective. But maybe this whole thing was actually Crosshair's idea. Maybe he knew they were developing this technology, and he hoped he could use it on his brothers, so he and his squad could be reunited and fighting together for the Empire. After all, he did offer Hunter a chance to join him the last time they were in Topoka City. And it's why I'm going to give you what you never gave me. A chance. So now let's talk about episode 7, Extraction. The two episodes actually mirror one another. The first follows the assassin as he sneaks into the base when he's outnumbered. And then the second episode features the Bad Batch being outnumbered and sneaking out of the base. Again, it's like poetry, so if they rhyme. And right off the bat, I have to admit that earlier in this video, I said that Wolf was already on Rex's squad. Well, I was wrong. Here's what happened. I didn't know they were dropping two episodes today. I thought it was only one. So when I found out, me and the team worked late last night to create the second half of this video. And I read the credits in episode six, I saw Wolf's name and I assumed that he was one of Rex's rebels. And then when I saw this guy in the Wolfpack armor exit from the new Class Republic attack shuttle that we first saw in the Clone Wars episode, Cat and Mouse, I knew I was wrong. So wait, what's the Wolfpack? Okay, so this is Commander Wolf, the one-eyed clone that we see living with Rex in Star Wars Rebels. And by the way, you can't blame me for getting this wrong. They all have the same voice and they all wore helmets all through episode six. I just assumed that Wolf wasn't wearing his old armor. But here he is in his wolf pack glory. Now notice his helmet looks painted like a wolf and on his pauldron we see the symbol of the wolf pack otherwise known as the 104th division. Like wow! my favorite. This division appeared in 12 Clone Wars episodes, but first appeared in the episode Rising Malevolence, and it was led by Jedi Master Plo Koon. You know, this guy. So we actually saw that wolf symbol appear like all through Clone Wars, but also on the Walker in Star Wars Rebels and once in live action here in The Mandalorian. But this is the wolf pack's first appearance in The Bad Batch. Now it's interesting to see how sheltered Wolf is. He has no idea that there are clones who are fighting against the Empire. These are clones. They're not insurgents. They are both. And this Republic Commando, by the way, is Hilo, not the aforementioned Scorch. They're so different. Hey, why did the Empire send a bunch of clones to arrest other clones? And why are only two new class Republic attack shuttles? Good question. I think it's because everything related to Mount Tantus has to have complete secrecy. Like, if it got out that the Emperor was trying to clone himself, then any Jedi left alive would obviously come and try to destroy the facility. This is the most important secret in the Empire, even more so than the Death Star. So they could not risk sending regular troopers or like a massive armada. They sent the clones because they're under Hemlock's control, and Hemlock assumes that they are all still obeying every order he gives. But as we see all throughout the Bad Batch, that pesky individuality keeps shining through. When Wolf realizes how they're escaping, he orders a pincer movement where they block off both exits. But Clone X goes it alone. Now, this episode reveals that there really is something up with these guys, and they relate to Crosshair somehow. Last episode, Crosshair was afraid when he saw one of them. He knew they had a tracker embedded in their bodies. It's not the kind of tracker your scans would pick up. And he deflected the question of why he didn't join them. Being defective 
is in my nature. But we're starting to see that that's not the real answer. Like later, Clone X says, You had your chance to be one of us. Here's what I think happened. I think they altered the DNA of these clones and spliced in some of Crosshair's DNA. I mean, think about it. All of these Clone X's are snipers, assassins, and loners. And Crosshair was specifically bred to be a sniper. And snipers, by their nature, are loners. Throughout the episode, we see them employing similar tactics, even getting matching shots of them looking through their scopes. And by the way, Crosshair has a thermal scope just like Zam Wessel did in Attack of the Clones. Now, I hope this Clone X theory is right because uh, it'd be similar to the young Wolverine clone in Logan. Crosshair is already facing his inner demons, grappling with mistakes he made when he served the Empire. So having these clones be physical extensions of his mistakes would be a way for him to face his demons externally as well, just like Logan facing his mindless, savage self in Logan. <laughs> Now, I mentioned earlier that the HQ looks like a Bomar Monastery, like Jabba's Palace, even complete with the adjacent tower. And Jabba's Palace also had a spiral staircase, like the one the Bad Batch used to escape. I just love the design of this place, like how the hatches and doorways are all carved right into the rock, and everything uses the spire as a support structure for its architecture. So, Ray, where are they going again? They're trying to get to a small hidden shuttle so they can use the comms, because the first thing Clone X did last episode was take out all of the comm systems. During the first face-off between Crosshair and Clone X, we see Crosshair shaky hand cost him a kill. So instead, he cheats and uses an explosive. Now, this fight reminded me of the mission at the beginning of Season 2, when Crosshair easily uses reflectors to pull off trick shots and take down his enemies. Now, his inability to take a simple shot here shows how much his trauma has degraded his ability to fight. Also, apparently, Batcher is a girl. Don't worry. She only bites half of the time. I mean, for the first three episodes, I really thought she was named Betcha because of Omega's accent. But I think this is the first time we've actually had the pet's gender confirmed. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really see the world through that lens. Fair enough. So Crosshair and Omega have some fun banter. You're as bad as Hunter. Oh, I'm much worse. Which Hauser notices. You're different than you were on Ryloth. So then they have a heart to heart about the choices that Crosshair has made, where he lays out his reasons. Loyalty meant something to me. The Empire didn't go both ways. Yeah, and it took Crosshair forever to make that decision. I mean, most people would have left the Empire after they tried to drown you at Topoka City, but this guy hung on until he had to frag an officer. <laughs> And actually, that musical theme you heard there, Crosshair's leitmotif, is also heard here when Crosshair talks about loyalty. So we get a cat and mouse chase with the bats trying to escape to the jungle. And here, note the Wilhelm scream. Here's Wilhelm. A Wilhelm scream. It's a really popular sound effect that's been used in like every movie ever. And then Crosshair and Clone X have a vibro knife fight on the edge of a waterfall, setting the stage for the most epic waterfall battle since this. Is this your game? But instead, it's over really quickly, and Clone X easily defeats Crosshair. It makes sense. I mean, he was bred to fight from a distance, not hand-to-hand -hand combat. And then, when he goes over the edge, Doug, you want to say it? Sure. I didn't kill my wife. I don't care. Awesome. High five. So then we get the dramatic standoff where Wolf realizes that he has been chasing Rex this entire time. I thought you were dead. He's referring to the final episode of The Clone Wars, where Rex and Ahsoka barely escaped a ship of renegade clones after Order 66 was activated. That episode was the perfect jumping off point for the show The Bad Batch. Ahsoka removes Rex's control chip, but rather than side with his clone brothers, rather than just follow orders, Rex chooses to follow his heart and save Ahsoka. The Bad Batch faced a similar choice in episode one, when they chose not to kill young Caleb Dune, but Crosshair, of his own free will, made the choice to follow orders and stay with the Empire. And in a lot of ways, all of this is laying down the theme of the entire original trilogy. It's all about people making the choice to fight against the Empire instead of simply doing everything the Empire says. Cause you did what they told ya. Exactly. Rex appeals to Wolf's conscience. You're hunting a child. And it works. It doesn't work enough to sway Wolf to actually join Rex yet, but I think this is a pivotal decision. When Hemlock finds out that Wolf had Omega but chose to let her go, he's going to react two ways. One, he will have Wolf and the clones under his command arrested, so Rex will have to then go and save him from Mount Tantus. And two, Hemlock will order all the clones to have the procedure that removes their individuality, which is actually what the Kaminoans originally promised. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. And yes, the clones might have been designed that way, just as every army is designed a certain way. But the realities of war have a way of altering your plans, and the clones' individuality surfaced over the years as they served under the Jedi. Echo and Gregor are on the shuttle, and Wolf gets a parting line that spells out his true loyalty. But the clones 
We owe them that. But meanwhile, Clone X is alive, and wouldn't it be something if he was the one who ended up executing most of this squad of traitors on Hemlock's orders? On the ship, Hunter tells Rex, You can't win this fight. And even though Rex isn't done yet, we do know that he retires by the time we see him in Star Wars Rebels. So this could be the moment where Hunter plants that little seed in his brain. So now we're going to see the Bad Batch look for answers and try to find out what the heck an M count is. Their quest might make them cross paths with Asajj Ventress, one of the few lightsaber swingers that's still out there. Well guys, that's all the Easter eggs we found, but if you found any, let me know in the comments below or at me on Twitter. And if it's your first time here, please subscribe and smash that bell for alerts. For Screen Crush, I'm Ryan Airy.